Hello everyone, it's Caleb. I know it's been a while. Dude, it's been six months. But I'm back with a follow-up to my first video, which should be linked in the corner or the description somewhere. Today we're going to be building a general procedural mesh animation component which can be used to make some pretty cool animations. So without further ado, let's get into it. Alright, so before we start coding, I just wanted to give a bit of a rundown about how graphics work, especially in the web. So let's start off with graphics APIs. Graphics APIs basically allow us to access hardware like GPUs for rendering high-performance graphics. Common APIs include OpenGL, Vulkan, DirectX, Metal, and our API of interest, WebGL. WebGL is a JavaScript API with a very similar interface to OpenGL that's used for the web and can be used in the HTML Canvas component. However, due to its complexity, there are a number of libraries that basically wrap WebGL to make it easier to use for developers. One of these libraries, the one that we're going to be looking at, is 3JS. Now, 3JS is pretty great, but it's imperative by nature, which can get annoying at times. That's where React 3 Fiber comes in. React 3 Fiber is a React renderer that basically solves this problem, and it allows developers to write scenes declaratively with React components. So with that out of the way, let's get into coding. Let's start by opening a terminal in VS Code and creating a React project named app with create React app, which should suffice for our purposes. Once that finishes, we can cd into the project directory app and install our additional dependencies, which are 3JS, React 3 Fiber, and SAS just to make our styling a bit easier. I'm using Yarn here, but feel free to use NPM instead if you want. Once that's done, we can run yarn start to start up a development server, which should eventually display the create react app template in your default web browser. Opening up our app folder, we can rename our CSS files to SCSS, updating the imports in index.js and app.js. While we're at it, we can also delete the template code and logo import in app.js and add a div to hold our animation with class name in it. Moving into our app.scss file, we can again delete the template and add in some basic styling. Using position fixed and setting the width, height, and z index of our anim div, we can essentially put our resulting animation in the background, which allows us to add other HTML elements on top of the background later. Let's now create a new file, anim.js, to store two components for our animation. Mesh anim will be our generalized procedural mesh animation component, and the anim component can simply wrap mesh anim, implementing the specifics of the lava animation that you saw in the beginning of the video. For now, let's just leave the implementations empty. Moving back to app.js, we can start setting up our scene. We'll start by importing the base canvas component from React 3 Fiber along with the animation we just made. Let's then create a component called Animation Canvas, wrapping the canvas component. We can specify the position and field of view of our camera through the props for a scene. I found that these values work well, but feel free to tinker with it to get some different effects. Let's also add some ambient light and place our anim component in the canvas. We can then call this Animation Canvas in our app component. Remember that React 3 Fiber and 3GS wrap WebGL which is tied to the HTML canvas element. Because of this, all three JS components must be placed inside a canvas element to avoid errors. Also, don't forget that React 3 Fiber is just a renderer that expresses 3JS as React components. So everything you read in the 3JS docs should work extremely similarly. With our scene set up, it's time to start thinking about meshes in WebGL. In graphics, meshes are collections of vertices, edges, and faces, typically triangles. Graphics APIs like WebGL are able to render these triangle collections on screen, which displays the mesh. But in order to do this, we need to know the coordinates of each vertex in 3D space, as well as which vertices make up each triangle. This is typically done with a vertex and index buffer, respectively. A vertex buffer is basically an array encoding each point in 3D space along with the data associated with that point, like normals and color data. 
For each triangle, we could create three separate vertices, but if we consider a simple mesh like a square, we quickly see that this results in some inefficiencies. Notice how there are two redundant vertices along the shared edge of the bottom left and top right triangle. This is where index buffers come in. Index buffers are arrays where every three entries specify the indices of the vertices in the vertex buffer that make up a particular triangle. Using this optimization, we can create each vertex in the mesh once and connect the appropriate vertices in the index buffer. We can then pass these buffers to WebGL to render the geometry. Alright, with that background information, let's start simple by coding the mesh for our grid. We know that our grid is defined by a couple of parameters, the number of points on each axis, the width and height, along with the distance between neighboring points on a non-diagonal axis, what I'm calling the separation. We can pass these parameters as props to our mesh anim component, along with the position and rotation of the entire 3D mesh. We start by creating the vertices in our grid stored in our vertex buffer. Using the useMemo hook, we can memoize or compute this buffer once and only recalculate it when one of its dependencies change. Remember that for our vertices, we not only need to define their position, but normal and color data as well. We can use a nested for loop over the two axes to populate our vertices. For each vertex, we can then center its corresponding position with respect to the origin, and then scale it by multiplying by the separation. We can repeat this process for both the x and y direction, hardcoding the z value to zero for now. Then we can add each position coordinate to the positions array. Similarly, we can hardcode the color to white, remembering that each color channel RGB is on a zero to one scale. Using a similar process as before, we can also add these into our colors array. Finally, we can hardcode the normals to the Z plus direction and push them in as well. I'm not going to be recalculating normals here since I just want the mesh to be visible and don't really care how it lights for this animation. Once all is said and done, we can return these arrays as float32 arrays and add the grid parameters to the dependency list of the use memo. Now figuring out our index buffer is a bit more tricky. The general idea is to loop over all the squares in the grid, triangulating each square. Here I'm going to be using the bottom right and top left triangles. Since our vertex buffer is a flat 1D array, we also need a way to access the indices of each corner vertex of each square in the vertex buffer. Looping over each axis, we can do this by incrementing an external variable i, which should contain the index of the bottom left vertex of each square. Let's also remember to skip over the vertices in the top row and right column, incrementing i accordingly so that we don't triangulate non-existent squares. Using this i and our width, we can get the index of each corner and add each triangle to our index buffer. Finally, since the values in an index buffer are indices, we can return a buffer of unsigned ints and also add the width and height to our dependency list. Now that we have our buffers, we can create and return a mesh component at the specified position and rotation. To add our data, we add a buffer geometry component and add each buffer attribute separately inside of it. For each attribute, we use the attach object prop to bind our component to its respective named parent property in the 3JS documentation. We then add the data itself as an array, specify the number of items in the array, as well as the size of each item. Position, for example, would have an item size of 3 since it has x, y, and z coordinates. We then repeat this process for the position, color, normals, and index using the correct attribute, array, count, and item size. We can now specify how to render this buffer geometry by adding a mesh standard material. Let's use the vertex colors prop to color our mesh according to the color data specified at each vertex, interpolating for the faces. We can use the double side option so that we can see both sides of the mesh and then set wireframe to true so that we can also see the triangles and edges. Since the double side option comes from 3JS, let's also remember to import it at the top. Let's take a step back and view what we have so far. In our anim component, let's return a mesh anim centered at the origin. 
Now a quick side note, because of the orientation of axes in 3JS, we also need to remember to add a rotation of minus pi over 2 here so that the positive z direction is upward. But putting in some placeholder values for our grid, we can save our work and see the result in the browser, which is, you know, white grid z equals 0 evenly spaced squares, each composed of two triangles, so we did it. Now that we have our grid working, let's add in some animation support. Here's the general idea. We'll keep track of some state t over the course of the animation, which is initialized with init and updated every frame according to the update function. Since we want to animate the color and height of each point, we'll also take in two functions that compute the color and z coordinate given the position of any point and the current animation state. Let's use the variable t to keep track of this current animation state throughout our component. Then, in our vertex buffer, let's replace the hard-coded z and color data with the result of our two functions, updating the dependency list accordingly. In order to update the position and color data of our mesh during the animation, we're going to need a reference to the corresponding buffer attributes. We can do this using React's useRef hook and the ref prop on each buffer attribute. Then, we can use React 3 Fiber's useFrame hook which takes in a callback that runs every frame to update t and the buffers. Let's first use our ref to get the current position and color buffers, looping over each axis of our grid and maintaining a global counter, which I'm calling i, we can iterate over each vertex in our one-dimensional buffers. Using i and offsets, we can get each coordinate of the position of each vertex and use it to calculate the new z value and the new color values. We set these new values in the buffers and use the refs to change the needs update prop to true so that the buffer attributes will actually update with the new data. We now have all the scaffolding we need in place, so moving into our anim component, let's just implement our z and color functions to return random values every frame using math.random just to check that everything is working. We can then pass in these two functions using the props, and for simplicity, let's let our animation state just keep track of one value, what we'll call the time, which will be initialized at zero and increment by 0.002 every frame. This probably won't look the best, but at least it serves as a proof of concept that our buffers are being updated every frame. Viewing the result, we see a bunch of chaos, random colors, random z values, exactly what we expected. At this point, we're practically finished. From here, it's just a matter of playing around with parameters and functions to achieve all kinds of results, including the lava landscape shown at the beginning. To achieve this particular effect, I used layered Perlin noise. Unfortunately, JavaScript doesn't come with a built-in coherent noise implementation, so... I used my resources and found this really nice implementation by Stefan Gustafsson. I've tweaked it a bit and have linked the modified version along with the original in the description for those who are following along. It's also in the GitHub repository containing all of the source code for this project. Now that we've given credit where credit's due, let's import both noise and Perlin3 from noise.js. Using math.random, we can calculate a random 16-bit seed and initialize the noise function. Let's create a function sample noise where we'll sample our layered 3D Perlin noise at some 3D point. Now, the topic of noise deserves a whole nother video, so I won't go into that much detail here. But in short, Perlin noise is a type of coherent noise, which means that the value of the noise at close inputs has close outputs. Perlin noise is often used for terrain generation and is layered in order to achieve greater detail. The general idea is to add multiple samples of Perlin noise at differing amplitudes and frequencies on top of each other. Higher frequencies lead to more variation, while higher amplitudes lead to larger overall values. The samples with low frequencies and high amplitudes correspond with the general features of the noise, while samples with high frequencies and low amplitudes control the small detail of the noise. To implement this, we define a number of parameters, the persistence, the lacunarity, the number of octaves, and the scale. 
We first start our amplitude and frequency at 1, and then we iterate over each octave or layer, keeping track of a running sum, the value. For each octave, we run Stefan's Perlin 3 function, scaling the initial point using the scale and frequency, and scaling the output by the amplitude. We then add this result to our running sum. Next, we multiply the amplitude by the persistence and the frequency by the lacunarity. As the octave increases, this results in the amplitude declining and the frequency increasing exponentially. So, higher octaves are responsible for finer and finer detail. After iterating, we simply return our running total. We can now sample our noise function with z equal to the time to animate through 2D slices of the 3D noise. Playing around with the color function, I found that the results for these values looked a lot like lava. Optionally, we can go back to our material and set wireframe to false to get our final animation. And with that, we're officially done! Now, there are a ton of animations that you can make with this, so if you manage to build something really cool, feel free to post in the comments. Likewise, if you have a question. Uh, any and all feedback is super appreciated, and with that, I'll see you in the next video.